Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and fine woodworking editor, Tom McKenna. With me this episode are Executive Art Director Mike Pekovich. Hey, guys. Special Projects Editor Matt Kenny. Hello, everyone. And web producer Ben Strano. Hey. Uh, as always, Jeff Rose is manning the camera and trying to keep us in line. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to mention again that uh, we have a podcast survey online. Um, if you sign up and get the survey, they get, they can send in a, is it a self-addressed stamped envelope no. for, for stickers, Ben? How does that work again? No, there is a field on the survey for your address and we'll just send you Apparently, sometimes the field doesn't always come up at the end of the survey. Okay. So if it's not, just send an email to F or send an email to shoptalk at taunton.com and with your address, and I'll send you out stickers. Yeah, come and get some. Cool. Um, the other thing before we roll, we, uh, we just <clears throat> are uh, looking at our latest issue, number 262. And um, pretty cool issue. We've got a uh, cool trestle table on the cover. Uh, what was one of your favorite highlights, Mike? Uh, it's just that it went out the door. On time. Uh, that's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> I, <don't>, uh, <laughs> I could tell someone didn't read the show notes before. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my my favorite pieces um, was Designer's Notebook. Um, Bob Korzak made this cool little... Uh, cabinet or chest of drawers that Mike that, Korsak. Mike Korsak. Thank you. Um, that sit on a, on a cool shapely base, um, gets into details on using a mock-up, which is always something that we, we talk about a lot. Um, in when we're designing and building stuff. Very cool. Awesome. I like the, uh, Tim Manny, uh, oh, shape yeah, horse. Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, the title for the handwork by, uh, uh, it wasn't by Tim. It was by the Curtis, Curtis Buchanan. Buchanan. It's like uh, how to ride a shave. How to ride a shave. Horse. How to ride a shave horse. Giddy up is what they <laughs> say. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Tim Manny article is called "Build a Thoroughbred." Build a Thoroughbred. Yes. Build, build a Thoroughbred. Enough horse punnery for the last five years, probably. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we've been settled <laughs> enough with that. I think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to trot those out anytime soon again. We'll keep it in the barn. Yeah. All right. Uh, we better make hay while we can. Um, let's get. <laughs> let's get to some questions and get some uh, get serious here. Um, question one comes from Noah, and Noah says, "I recently got my shop set up very nicely. Now I have to move. Should I just kill myself, or is there a better way?" I'd well, love some <laughs> killing yourself is really not going to help you move the shop. So there's got to be a better they, way. Well, we hope so. Uh, I'd love some advice on moving large machines, parting with jigs, saving jigs, neat pieces of wood, useful pieces of wood, containers of potentially useful junk, and all that stuff that some of us collect in our shops. Um, sounds like Noah has some big stuff to move. He's got a uh, cabinet style saw, eight inch joiner, fifteen inch planer. An edge sander, drum sander, 14-inch bandsaw, two canister dust collectors. Uh, sounds like everything is wheels, um, except for the bandsaw. And he does not have a pickup truck, and he's moving 250 miles. We know everything about Noah, except just, the size of his arc. You just went through this, Matt. Yes. Is there any, yeah. like, silver lining to this horrible rain cloud of an event in terms of having to move a shop? Yeah, I mean, one of the things was is that it forced me to throw crap out. Yeah, right. That is awesome. And I, you know, as I, it was staggering how much crap I had accumulated in nine years in that house. And um, as I started, and particularly like wood, I, I burned a lot of wood <laughs> right before <laughs> I moved. Um, I realized just going through all this stuff, it was like, you know, I, stuff I had always tried to be really. Uh, tough when deciding whether or not to save wood. Right. And then I started to go through this stuff and I realized even though I was sort of being really tough when I did that and burned more than I kept, I still accumulated stuff. And I was like, I didn't even remember that I had this. Yeah, that's the worst part. Yeah. yeah. And if I didn't remember that I had it, it got burnt. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So when I, did I buy that? <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I threw out a lot. I mean, I burnt a lot of well, here's a, scrap. Here's a question. How much crap did you sell to Ben? <laughs> uh, he wouldn't buy anything. Rats. I've sold off, and I sold off some stuff. Um, 
But uh, I threw out a lot of small pieces of MDF and plywood that I kept around because they'd make good stops or something. Um, in term, but in terms of moving stuff, and you got 250 miles to go. You, this Noah needs to just suck it up and rent a truck. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, I want a U-Haul or something. A U-Haul, anyway, with right. a, like the little rampy, or would you go with the lift gate? Oh, you got well. Well, he probably. He says everything's the cabinet, on wheels. So, uh, th- those those ramps are really narrow. I don't think yeah. you can get a cabinet saw up there. He probably needs a lift gate uh, and, or a truck with a you know, definitely a truck with a low bed. Like some of them, you get and they're going to be like a normal box truck with a with a commercial height. You know, mm-hmm. for a com- for a, a, a normal sort of commercial loading dock. Right. But then other moving trucks are more homeowner friendly and they have lower decks. And you want to get one with a lower deck so you're not pushing it up as high. And uh, if you can get something with a lift gate, do that. But if there's if you have another way to get things in, you know that's fine as well. I mean, when we when I moved my shop, uh, Noah, I hope that you have made some good friends <laughs> because <laughs> I called. I had like five or six people come over and help me. Uh, moved my shop. Ben came over with a large uh, flatbed trailer, and we were able to get everything in two loads. Um, if everything's on wheels, it's not that big of a deal. We had to disassemble my joiner yeah. and move that, which was difficult. But uh, all the rest of the stuff was kind of easy because it was either wheeled or not too heavy. Um, make sure that when you're in the when you get stuff in the truck to secure it safely because you don't want something falling over or breaking because it was uh, not secured properly. So everything needs to get tied down. You can't just trust cram, you know, the, the, the force of cramming stuff in yes. to keep a 400 pound <laughs> yeah. table saw. Or have one of your friends sit in the back and try right. to hold it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and the best thing for that is ratchet tie downs. Yeah. You just know, to get, the walls. Right? To the walls. Yeah. yeah. Rope. Don't use rope. Use a ratchet tie down. Yeah. Tell what you say? Yeah, you got to talking to your <laughs> microphone that you now have set up. Tell them what you did with the, what, what we did with the bandsaw because that was really interesting. With the bandsaw, I believe, what, didn't we lay it back down on its spine? Yeah, but and we clamped or we bolted uh, two by fours to the base, one two by four to the base, and that two by four extended f- a couple, maybe a foot and a half out on either side uh-huh. to further stabilize it, and that. Um, that's what we did to stay, and that that worked well. Huh. Uh, so, because most bandsaws in their base are going to have a place for you to bolt it to the floor, so we just sent bolts through that and attached a two by four uh, to the base and and leaned it back on its spine, and then secured it to the to the flatbed trailer. But that two by four stabilized it and prevented it from cool from falling over. I mean, one other option for, for Noah is it might be reasonable if you have, if you're going to have to rent a big truck with a lift gate, you know, it's a big thing to drive. If you've never driven one, look at a mover, you know, it could, he might be able to get a mover for, you know, under 1500 bucks, depending on where he lives. And that might be a worthwhile expense. Yeah. And, but think really carefully about the stuff that you yeah. really need. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, I'm ready, like the, my radio alarm saw, it made it, I have a storage unit right now where I have all my lumber and it's in there. It ain't going to make it back to my shop. I'm going to sell it or give it away or something because I just. Ben, Ben wants it. I hear that. That ben call for the radio alarm saw. Yeah. Say, no, do I do Come on. Do yeah. I I'm going to no drop it of off it. at Ben's on a Friday <laughs> night at about 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know it's a situation where Noah's stressing out about the big machinery because that's what you think about in a move. But that's not what I would. You yeah, know. he's going to get all of this on the truck, all the heavy stuff. It's like it's I'm little done, stuff, and then like turn around it. and look at the shop. Yeah, and it's oh like my gosh, crammed. It's There's like, so much little uh, stuff, and it yeah. feels like you're never going to get it all moved. Yeah. And the other thing is the workbench. You know, I don't know what kind of workbench he has, but if he's got a, a massive one, big it's another thing. big old piece to yeah. move. Yeah, but a work, work. Here's one tip on a workbench: never try to move a workbench in the back of a truck 
a pickup truck unsecured with on the Route 25 on in Newtown, Route 25 Connecticut. Route 25 in Newtown <laughs> with the bench top up. Because <laughs> I don't care how slow you go around a corner, that thing's coming out of the back of the truck. And people will hear it. <laughs> yes, and it will destroy the bench. It will. That poor bench was never the same. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's not, that bench is never, yeah. Yeah, I haven't, like, moved, moved my shop since I came to Connecticut, but when I redid my garage, I had to pull everything out into a pod in the driveway, and it had that same effect of... A lot of stuff that went into the pod never came back out. That's another option because pods are low to the ground. Oh, yeah. You probably could wheel everything in there. They have pretty serious weight limits, I think, on on some of them, no? Like they can take a lot of weight. No, they they don't. No? Okay. um, When we got our pod, the guy said that they've had people, like, drive cars in. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, as long as the – and those – Trucks or whatever the machine that they use to to do them, they they can oh. pick to pick up. Just That's a really good option because yeah. those yeah. are those are pretty low. Yeah, you could easily build a little ramp yeah, or whatever it all, to get it's stuff It's going to cost there. you a couple hundred bucks, yeah. but the one thing I found when I moved some um, to my my house uh, first, I put my stuff in the garage, thinking I was going to work out there, and I and I changed my mind and. My, I have a cabinet saw, a contractor saw, and it's on a mobile base. And and what you discover is that the mobile bases don't work on you know things other than concrete. So I had to like <laughs> you know basically take the, uh, the the saw off the base and carry the thing around the back and through the grass and stuff. But um, actually, Matt, you talked about a really cool way to was it moving your jointer with the with the pipes. It was my bandsaw. You, yeah, I rolled it across the floor using four three quarter inch. Uh, black, you know, gas pipes uh, from my uh, pipe clamp collection. Yeah, that's a really good solution. Even yeah. if in a driveway, sometimes those rolling roller stands don't move very well, and if you're having trouble, that's a pretty good solution, yeah. I think. Yeah, that worked really well. Did I talk about that on the podcast? Yeah, you did. I did. I okay. repeated it. Look at that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to uh, Arthur's question. <clears throat> and Arthur says, "How do you guys manage material for drawer sides?" Say you were making a cabinet with multiple drawers and you wanted the drawer size to be half inch thick. Would you get four quarter stock, plane it down via thickness planer, or is it better to get five quarter and resaw? Well, five quarter is only going to give you one drawer side at a half inch. Yeah. <clears throat> because yeah. you're going to want to, first of all, you can't cut it at a half inch. You've got to cut it at least five eighths. So you're only so if you really want to get two pieces, you got to go with start with eight six quarter at the minimum. You can sometimes yeah. get three out of eight quarter. Yeah, especially if you don't mind. If you're looking for anywhere between three eighths and a half for drawer size, you can probably get three. Uh, it's a tough question because I ha- have kind of bitten the bullet and just pulling it down, taking it down. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I've I've I don't build. I haven't built that many drawers in the past couple of years, but when I have, I wind up. Typically, just going to Home Depot and buying some three quarter inch pine and and working that down. Yeah, because that's already five eighths of an inch. Thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not much planing, and if you if you choose wisely, you know I don't mind a knot or two on like a drawer back or something like that. But yeah. I mean, um, but here's the thing about drawer. It's, I mean, I would recommend using something like basswood, white pine, not poplar. I, I I've gone to the point where I think poplar is disgusting as a secondary wood. Um, but it's not very expensive, and just kind of bite the bullet. What? Ben has something to say. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> I, was, I was just gonna go like make a weird face behind him. That's all I was gonna do. Oh, yeah, I know. People, a lot of people. Uh, but just, I, I just now <laughs> will bite the bullet and plane it down. But I actually think half inch might be a little thick for a drawer side. Like for chest of drawers, I may sometimes I kind of get down to like five eighths, just because. Yeah. It doesn't have to be thin, thin, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. I, I, the last drawer I made was had half inch sides, and it felt thick to me. You know, so I'm kind of thinking with Matt that next time I do them, I may go down. But Mike's thicker. Like but if thicker. but if for bigger, pe- for a bigger big piece. drawers, yeah. Must have yeah, like I had a quarter little, inch. This, the little drawer I made was was little. Yeah, so. little tiny stuff will go down to yeah. quarter of an inch. Yeah, but if I were chest of drawers. A lot of it depends on how thick the drawer front is. Right. You know, because if, if your drawer front is only a half inch, drawer sides that are a half inch kind of look a little horsey. My drawer front's mm-hmm. never going to be a half inch on a chest of drawers. No. So you'd make it three quarter. Yeah. 
So you can go three quarter, five eighths, leave a, an eighth inch lap or yeah, probably, I don't know. I have to go look and see. I'll probably shoot for half inch. Yeah. So he's right. Half inch is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but when I do half inch, I probably start with four quarter and just take it on down. Yeah. You, yeah. You're going to waste wood regardless. Yeah. So uh, you could, I'd probably start at a quarter, uh, four quarter and plane it down. Yeah. Cause resawing it, that's the thing where you resaw it, you, you got to leave at least an eighth of an inch. I mean, for a drawer side, let's say it's five inches even an eighth of an inch might not be enough because five inches is wide enough that it could cup a fair amount. Yeah. And so you might actually need to resaw it at three quarter. And so now you're looking at just, so that's uh, an inch and a half for two drawer sides plus any kerf that's coming out. Plus you're going to have to join it first. So you're really starting with eight quarter to get that. Yeah. Also on, on eight quarter, if you're trying to resaw three pieces, the middle piece <laughs> is going to be dead flat. That's going to be perfect. The what now? The middle piece of getting three pieces out of an eight quarter board. It's never going to move. It's perfect. But the ones on the outside closer to the surface, those Anything. are going to move more because of the case hardening. So, you, right. you you know, that's where you always kind of. Yeah. Anyway. All right. All right. Is that the only thing that I managed? Yeah. <laughs> I was um, actually, I was listening a little bit to the Fine Gardening podcast just because. And they're, it's, it's actually really good. It, it's far better than ours. And if you're into gardening, definitely listen to them. <clears throat> what? It, it but, is. It's good. It's better. Um, it's better they, than They better try than hard. <laughs> but they, they were using, in. it's like, <laughs> I, I got, <clears throat> I have an insight into how we sound to people who are not interested in woodworking <laughs> because. <laughs> And because again, because it's not that it's bad, but they're just talking. They're just throwing out something a, that you're not interested in. A lot of Latin names, and yeah. they're like, "What's your favorite variegated foliage plant?" Oh, it's like blah blah blah. I knew you were going to say that. You always say blah blah blah. Every answer has that in it, you know. And it's just like, wow, I'm so outside of this conversation that I feel bad for the people who listen to this podcast. So you're telling me that even on the Fine Gardening podcast, they have somebody who's always talking about blue tape. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, it's the equivalent of the half inch three TPI bandsaw blade. Yes. You know, it's so. Uh, yeah. Wow. All right. Tom gonna, says we're boring I'm everybody. Have to yeah. tune in. Uh, well, let's get to something uh, pretty exciting. It's time for our all time favorite tools of all time for this week. Cha, 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 cha. And we didn't have, we didn't have an effect for that, Ben. Um, it you wanna, should not be cha 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 cha. Whatever. <laughs> Just winging it here. I still have kids. They like the cha cha cha. I have never met a kid that likes someone going cha 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 cha. <laughs> they like doing it. <laughs> All right, uh, let's let's like... get out of this one fast. <laughs> How about you, Matt? You want to hit us up first? You want me to go first? We're doing the all-time favorite tool of all time <clears throat> this week, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, all right. Mine, because I recently used them, is my shop-made grooving planes. What? Nothing. Nothing. You've, you've said that before. So? And you made them. Yes. Okay. And ahead. you can buy them at mattkenny.com. No, you can't. <laughs> you want to buy the pair that I made, you can, but they're $5,000 each. Otherwise known as a 10-inch uh, table saw blade. <laughs> Mike does not appreciate the joy of using a shop made tool. I love your planes. I'm never going to make them. I was just hoping you'd give me a pair one of these days. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I made these many years ago. Now, we did an article in the magazine, a handwork, and it bombed because <laughs> people don't like to make their own tools, I guess. <laughs> but um, I just like them. They're... They are fun to use, you know, and they make a nice little sound, and they actually are very quick. And uh, I did. I made a little video and threw it up on Instagram, Kenny.Matt. And uh, <laughs> look at this. It's just they're awesome. And th it's really fast for something small, right? If you're going to do – if you have a lot of drawers to make, uh, it's not the way to go. But um, if you're making one drawer or you're just making a one – Panel, run frame and panel door, you know. Let's, you know, have yeah. a little fun, relax, and use a, a, a handmade tool or use a plow plane. Giddy up. 
Yeah. So that's my my tool this you, week. You know where I would use that um, as if it were dialed in. So where the little tab that you left next to the groove was exactly the same with the, the groove. You can use that for doing like the, your little lids for boxes mm -hmm. where you sort of groove the lid and then you groove the side uh, of the box and it fits in perfectly. Yeah. If that works, I'd be down with that. That, uh, I don't, I mean, it, that, that pair is set up that it cuts an eighth inch groove yeah. an eighth of an inch away. That's pretty cool. From the fence. Right. I think, yeah. So I, you know, how accurate is that? I don't know because I didn't really, when I made it, I didn't really care. It's, you know, right. they're, they're just the same. The two are the same. Um, and, uh, but it's close to that, you know, and, uh, I, I, I could try that and see if it works. Yeah. I don't know if I would go through <clears throat> the effort to really dial that in though. Even if you left it just a little heavy, so a couple plain swipes on Off. the tab to fit, yes. that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Mike? Cool. Well, this is related to a um, tool bomb of the recent past where I was doing this uh, wall cabinet and it had small doors. First one I made, it had small square doors that were maybe seven inches wide. And I couldn't get a regular drill in there to drill for the hinge screws. And so I was looking for one of those right angle drills. I went to Home Depot. I couldn't find one, but I did find one of these bizarre cordless multi-tools that had a um, drill chuck head you could attach to it. And it was just terrible. It was the most terrible thing I'd ever used in my whole life. And I returned it. So I'm making another little wall cabinet with a little square door. And <laughs> you went and bought it again and returned it no. again. <laughs> and I said, oh, I don't have a drill to fit in there. It's like, oh, that's right. That's why I bought that thing. So this time I went over to um, Tools, Tools Plus, Plus. Yeah. and they had a corded <laughs> Milwaukee right angle drill. Right angle drill. It's like it does nothing but, but drill yeah. a hole at a right angle. And I bought it and it worked and I did not return this one. And it's uh, in my drawer. The only thing I wish is I've gotten used to when I do use a corded power tool. I like the ones like with the little short, short cord that yeah. you plug in. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know, what is it, six inches or 12 inches? Because you don't have this big, giant cord rolled up in your drawer with all your power tools. This one has a long cord. It's the only thing bad, and I can't. I'm not complaining about it. So yeah. here, here's a tool that I love that is related to it may solve your problem. Uh they're made by a company called Night Eyes, N-I-G-H-T-E-Z-E, -E, I think is how it's, I don't know how to pronounce okay. it, but that's no. how it's spelled. Easy e is something different. <laughs> Easy e yeah. <laughs> um, they are basically industrial uh, bread bag ties. So it's like a, it's a piece of wire inside a rubberized exterior, and they're reusable. And uh, so I use those like on all my like cords now and i use them on my like uh oh okay so just to i thought you were gonna cords. drill a hole with yeah this that's thing. what i was so like yeah. where are we going drilling? what are you doing you wind it up and then you oh, okay you you know you wind your cord up and then you secure it with this thing and yeah. then it's a nice orderly yeah thing. those are actually cool that version or the rubber version with yeah. the little knobby in the hole yeah. or right. the velcro I just end up wrapping it 50 times around the body of the tool itself yeah which is you got to keep, nightmare. you have to keep the cord so it, there's no, it doesn't get all the kinks in it or twist it up. It's got to be in a nice sort of coil. Quarter twist per turn. Yeah. Yes. And it's got to, you know, it's got to be a nice size so that it doesn't get too tight of a memory. No, that's true. I agree with that. Side note, hey, nobody, sunny. nobody it's... Google night eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what they're called though? It's, it's, it's something different. It's, it's, they're nineties. It's a video, we'll say. Are you gonna get, is is IT gonna be talking to you later today about your Google searches? You gonna post that link on the site? No, That's no, 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 the no, post that. no. What was the, what was the name again? The term? <laughs> I think it's isn't it? It's, maybe it's N I T E E Z E. <laughs> they, they sell them like Home Depot and Lowe's. You know? yeah. yeah, they also make those cool S beaners. They make uh... <laughs> nobody Google S beaners. <laughs> These are real Shut products. Shut the Google off. <laughs> 
But I will tell you, in in your situation, what I've done <laughs> is uh, because there are certain um, hinges that I use all the time, right? And I just took the drill bit that was required for it and put it in a little wood handle. And because you're only drilling like two holes or something, you can just, you know, hold it and turn it with your hand and it makes a quick little hole. Huh. Huh. What are those little things called? Vix bits? No. Is it a gimlet or something? The one, though? No, that's a gimli. Don't don't Google gimlet. A gimlet gimlet is a drink. (laughs) They are called gimlets, yeah. Yeah. Same thing, but just a regular drill bit works. Yeah. Yeah, I have a... But don't also do not Google gimplet. (laughs) (laughs) I have a a, a right angle 12 volt cordless Bosch one that I never use until I need it. You know, it's, it's kind of a weird shape, and I thought it was kind of kooky when I got it, but for... Those tight installs, yeah. it works really well. Cool. Works really well. So I'm surprised you're not drilling those holes before you do the assembly. Blue tape. Because you can't fit the door. And I mean, you could probably locate the hinges bef- on the on the cabinet before you would do the assembly, right? I totally could dry fit. I use a hinge strip, but I could dry fit, get the hinge strip in place, drill it, pull yeah. it apart. Yeah, you can. I was not thinking that far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Tom? Hi. How you doing? Um, <laughs> well, my uh, my tool is uh, my little my little drill press. I'm very happy with it. I Aww. I bought it used um, for fifty bucks a couple years ago. Is it Chicago? Is that it's a Chicago no, baby. Chicago style from. drill press. Yeah, I know. Yep. We're not going to mention names, are we? No. Yeah. <laughs> but you like it? It's your favorite no. tool. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's great. You know, um, it's got a. The cool little foot pedal to turn it on and off. Huh. So um, it's got a nice oh, little light. It's an and oldie. A, and a, yeah, it's a, oh, it's an oldie. So it's probably not from that store. It could probably be when that. It's, comp- no, it's just it says Chicago on the the plate. Yeah. Is um, it Chicago Electric? Yeah, I think so. I think you know it's pretty generic, but uh, it looks cool though. It's cool, and and it came with. I, I didn't think I was ever going to use that table, and mm-hmm. I'm. I'm Planning to make a better one, but having a nice wide drill press table is a godsend. Yeah, but I've been using it a lot. But it's, it's not a fun table. Have. Next to it, <laughs> you were saying you used your drill press table as your workbench. Uh, I was. <laughs> yes. I was using it. That's where I. <laughs> I was. I had put my saw hook on the drill press table. Yeah. Because <laughs> my workbench was otherwise occupied with the project oh, that I was building. Okay. I thought so, Mike was saying that, like, you just used it as your no. workbench all the time. <laughs> it's like, what? That was from the last podcast you weren't here. And no. He was talking about You so. guys did a podcast without me? We did. It was yeah. Ben, and Ben was awesome. Yeah, I heard we got great yeah, reviews on that one. Good. Except for one guy didn't like Ben, and he's a jerk. So if you're he's listening and you don't like Ben. That was me, actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> you guys know I don't listen to the podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, my little benchtop drill press, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Um, anyway, let's get back to uh, questions, I guess. Right, Ben? Please. <laughs> this, please. Please, let's move on. we got to move away from that Google. Um, this one is from Jim, and Jim says, I'm hoping to get a table saw soon. Should I get a one and three quarter horsepower or the three horsepower model? I have the rough wiring for a 220 volt single phase, but so far I have all 120, 110 volt machines. Is the extra power of the three horsepower saw worth the effort of completing the wiring? Yes. Yeah, why not? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, because you, I'm guessing you might be talking about the saw stops, which are available in the one and three quarter or the three horse. And I've used both, and I've worked quite a bit on a saw stop with a one and three quarter horse, and with it's fine. Like I didn't notice the difference, and the only reason I ended up going with a with a three horse instead is just because. I do so much prep work on my software classes and stuff. I got that thing running a lot. So it's just I, just because I'm putting more wear and tear on it, that's the only reason I went to it. But it was a really hard decision. But 
if you have 220 and you're going to wire it, there's a lot of other reasons to wire for 220. You might be getting a bigger bandsaw, joiner, dust, dust planer, collector, bigger planer, you know, dust collector. If you want to go big on a dust collector. Yeah. Or a toaster. Some toasters are 220. <laughs> it's always worthwhile having um, a, 220. a 220 outlet or yeah. two. I, mean, I wish I had another one in my shop. So Actually, you, I wish I had five more 110 outlets yeah. too. But. So you may <laughs> want to go one and three horse 110, and that's great, but you know, you may end up probably wanting to wire 220 anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? I mean, my table saw is one horsepower. I've never had a problem with it, but it's an old, uh, an older repul- repulsion induction motor, uh-huh. and it builds up better torque from what I understand. Um, I don't even know. That probably doesn't even make sense, but it, it, it cuts great, and it's, I've never had it bogged down on anything, and I would still get three horsepower. Yeah. You know? If you if you're, I mean, if you, if you can if you've got the budget for it, it wouldn't hurt you. Right, it's not going to hurt. It might you. be overkill, but you'll I mean, be as a table saw, it might hurt you. You'll, <laughs> <but> <laughs> you know, that's going to be the same no matter how what size the motor you'll is. Be able to cross cut a car tire or something with that. <laughs> Just take a couple inches off my tire. <laughs> <laughs> you can use a grooving plane for a that. Very odd example. Um. <laughs> that's how I retread my tires with my grooving plane. <laughs> oh just, my God. Ben, it's falling off the rails, man. Can it you never started on the rails. <laughs> yeah, we were we were never on the rails. God. All right, let's get to uh, Cameron's question. Choo choo, everybody. And, no, it's cha cha. Uh, Cameron says, "I do my woodworking in a community shop, and I'm looking to build a mobile shop cart." to keep all of my tools and have a little bench top for assembly and other sorts of things. I remember watching Matt's router table build a while ago, and he made a rigid base to support the casters and cabinet. Do you think the rigid base is necessary? I want to maximize the amount of space I have inside the cabinet. Also, for the casters, should I have two non-swivel in the back and two locking swivel in the front? I have answers to all of these questions. I bet you do. And I have a comment. <laughs> Maybe not going to make the comment. Um, I would say the rigid base is, is it necessary? Probably not. Is it advisable? Yes. What do you mean by rigid base as opposed to what? Uh, like four posts instead of like... A, like, like a floppy base? <laughs> three sheets. I mean, it's so like a cabinet, it's so like three sheets of plywood. Would that be not, or or is a rigid base means? So the base that I use on all my shop cabinetry, which is all on wheels, is uh, two pieces of half inch or quarter inch MDF, and in between that, I'll get some, uh, you know, like two by fours or something, and mill those up square, okay, and turn those on edge. So what you create is sort of like an I beam, okay. And that's very rigid, and you don't have to worry about any of the weight on top of it ever oh, yeah, sagging yeah. Okay. the base. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's like kind of the John White style. Yeah, with it the is. Two yeah. Exactly. And I, I yeah. would, I would, I don't know if it's necessary or not, but I would, I think it's advisable that you do that because, yes. and also I don't understand, I don't understand how doing that would affect the amount of space inside the cabinet unless Some you're losing just a little bit of height, I guess. Yeah, but. No. I mean, unless you – it can go up as high as you want. Yeah, but – Well, if he wants to use it as a workbench, you're sort of – Is that what he says? He wants yeah. to use it as a workbench? Yeah, bench? so you're sort of – you want to keep so, it uh, at a good height. Assembly. I think it's I think it's a good trade-off. I would yeah. – that, yes. that little bit of interior space you're losing, uh, assuming height is critical – um, is worth it because you do want a rigid base, so yeah. that thing never sags. Um, yeah, maybe you just make those. You, you could probably make those ribs thinner or narrower. You know. Yeah, yeah you, you could. Know. That you could make them make those not as tall. Yeah. You know, um, I would do four swivel castles, casters as opposed to because it is a lot easier. Yeah, I'm I'm down with that. I I use yeah. the the mobile cart or the the casters I put on my router table. I have uh, two fixed and two swivel. And it's so frustrating. I just I, I want to replace right. the, the fixed yeah. ones with swivel. It's so, just yeah, all swivel because you can pull yeah, it straight totally. in and straight out of a yeah. spot against the wall. Um, yeah, at least two brakes in the front wheels. Yeah, you need, yeah, you need two brakes. locking casters, yeah. Yeah. and the other two don't have to lock, but they should swivel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is one of those things. Yeah, you're working in a community wood shop right now, so you want to build this thing. But even if you get a shop in the future. 
you're going to have this thing forever. Because I think this is one of those things I think I would want in my shop. Like if I had built it, I'm going to find a use for it. So mm -hmm. make the yeah. effort, build it nice now. And it's a good long-term investment. And, yes. and another thing, if he wants to use it as um, a, a workbench, you know, to, to be doing some handwork or assembly, uh, there's a product that Raleigh had reviewed some time ago that um, they're casters that you can lift up and, and drop down so the wheels are completely, right. you know, not in the equation anymore. So the feet of the, the workbench come down on the ground. So that's another product he can invest in as well. Yeah, you know, I, it doesn't... I would not recommend using a cabinet like this for hand tool work. But no, he, he says like for say assembly, that. like yeah, assembly, and yeah. that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it is. They're not just the nature of how these things are made. They're not really going to withstand the type of racking pressures that hand planing, for right. example, would put on it. I don't think. Yeah, and even if you can get the wheels up, it's still such a small footprint that yeah. it's not going to be a real yeah. stable base. Yeah, but it's a cool thing to have. But the other thing is, I. And not really criticizing this guy, but I've gotten a lot of quotes because I've made stuff for the magazine, right? And I love getting these questions where they're like, hey, I watched this and it's really cool. Uh, but what you did there, that's not really necessary. Wouldn't you change that? And it's just like, well, no, that's how I made it. That's, of course, I would, you know. Yes. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, you know, depends what you want. It's yeah. like I always advise people to get a, a cheap white backdrop, photo backdrop for taking pictures of your furniture. And invariably people ask, can I just use a white sheet, mm -hmm. like a bed sheet? It's like you certainly can if you want it to look like you photograph your furniture on a white bed sheet. Yeah, a lot so, of wrinkles and... Yeah. yeah, so it's always like, is it necessary? Yeah, it's up to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's necessary. Do it. D yeah. <laughs> do it. Very advisable. Do it. <laughs> now. <laughs> now. Do it now. What's your address? We're coming to check up on <laughs> We're it. Gonna make sure We're going to make sure it. you did it. <laughs> do it right. If you did, we'll give you some tacos. I just thought of this disco song, and I don't want to sing it. But <clears throat> anyway, um, it's time for our all-time favorite technique of all time. I think Jeff, did Jeff understand my <laughs> reference? Jeff gets it. <laughs> you know, it's a non sequitur. <laughs> <laughs> About the uh, disco? <laughs> yeah, we just made Jeff laugh. I like that. Um, it's time for our all-time favorite technique of all time <laughs> for this week. Do uh, you want to start us off, Mike? Did sure. Did you say shop cart query up there? Yeah. You're titling the individual questions now? Yes. I didn't know that. Wow. What's a query? Cool. <laughs> Tom McKenna, editor of Final <laughs> Brain Magazine, ladies and gentlemen. All right. All-time favorite technique of all time. Um, it is... Um, Basically, it's that trusty old finger joint jig um, that you use at the table saw. You clamp it to your fence. It has a little finger in it, and you can use it in conjunction with a dado blade or something to make box joints or finger joints, which it works really well for. Um, it's my favorite technique because I use that for other things as well. I use that to create the little half-lap grid for my Kumiko work. Um, it works out really well. And I just used it this past weekend um, to make something that's a little bit difficult to describe, but um, I'm going to be teaching a class where we're doing lots and lots of through tenons and multiple pieces. And rather than doing those by hand, I'm doing those on a hollow chisel mortiser. And because of that, the hollow chisel mortiser, um, I'm only making a cut halfway through just so you avoid the, the blowout. Then you have to flip it and come around the other half of the way through. I know what you're doing. But because I'm referencing off each edge of the piece, at some point I can have a stop lock on one end to do half. And, but then I would have to like change the stop lock to the other end of the table and flip it end to end. And if that stop lock isn't exactly in the right place, those mortises are not going to be lined up vertically on the case, which would be a nightmare to have misaligned mortises. Um, so I used my finger joint jig. And what I did is I put a 3 8 inch blade in there. I made a groove in a piece of MDF dead center of my board. And then I just, I have like three different stops. Um, so I made a finger joint jig to fit the 3 8 inch groove. I offset that um, and registered the center groove and that made a cut, uh, flipped it around and made another cut. So now I have a pair of grooves perfectly equidistant from my center groove. I repeated that two more times. So now I have three sets of mirrored grooves that are 
precisely distance from my center guy. Then all I did is I went to my mortiser, I put in my 3 8 inch hollow chiseled bit, aligned it to the center groove to center the table, locked everything down, and now I can just put a little stick into whatever groove I want to act as an end stop. So I can put it in, say, the right-hand groove to cut you know, the holes halfway through, put it in the left-hand uh, matching groove, uh, move my workpiece over, cut the other half, and everything is perfectly aligned, and all of this is due to my finger joint jig. That's it. Awesome. The old F double J. Yep. One of my That's cool. the yeah. highlight of my career at fine woodworking was when I did an article for with Doug Stowe about wooden hinges. Yes. And I wrote the headline Knuckles are finger joints. Because the knuckles of the hinges are finger made are finger joints. So it was knuckles or finger joints. Yes. That's how that was That's awesome. That was the highlight of my career so far. <laughs> it's not That's so much I, that you thought of that; it's that it got by Tom. <laughs> I don't think I was. I, around, I don't think I was around. I think I said was the editor. Uh, okay. It would have gotten past me because I kind of like it. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> but that's why Matt doesn't write headlines. No. <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> How about you, Matt? What about your uh, technique? So my technique is, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll present it as a technique, but it's a more general notion of feed rate hmm. and varying the feed rate to accomplish different things. For example, at the jointer, Right, you can uh, whiz something through the joiner very quickly. Right, say uh, if you have a long board and you're edge joining it, you can whiz it through there and straighten it really quick, and then go rip it down or whatever. But if you're going to say glue up a couple of boards to make a panel, and they're let's say it's four to five feet long, or a tabletop could be six, seven feet long. Right, that's a long edge. And you want that to be straight, and you want it to be cl clean to glue it together. Right. So you can straighten it going fast, but then if you come back and you go slow with the feed rate over the joiner to effectively increase the number of cuts per inch, sure. you get a much <clears throat> cleaner edge. Yeah. And it's actually comp it's as good as a hand plane edge because uh, it's the same thing it's a it's a knife cutting wood so you can then go straight to the glue up from that and not have to uh edge you know shoot it with a hand plane which you know something that's six seven eight feet long it can be not difficult but it can be challenging to hand plane that have it come out remain straight and have it not get cattywampus right out of square yeah as they say um, so, but there are other machines where you can slow down the feed rate, uh, to improve the quality of the cut that you're going to get, or that some places like the bandsaw, you actually kind of want to go faster to get a better, uh, I think my, my battery went dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, not all the time, but with some, you want a consistent yeah. feed rate at the bandsaw to get a, a cleaner cut. Yeah, if I'm and doing that's what I was thinking. Like tenons at yeah. the bandsaw, I go as slow as possible for that smooth surface. But if you're doing like fair curves or kind of S curves, I do find you get that speed rate up and right. it ends up with a little bit more true curve. Absolutely. Yeah. And then also with all like the same thing of the joiner, I think, uh, bandsaw, table saw, it's a consistent feed rate. That yeah. is important, yep. uh, especially at the bandsaw resawing. It's got to be consistent because uh, as soon as you adjust it, you're going to get one of those deeper cuts. Yes, that blade kind of detensions a little bit. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. You, yeah, so <clears throat> it's not so much a particular technique. It's just I've been thinking about that a lot recently about feed rate yeah. and how to you have to adjust the feed rate to accomplish different goals with a machine. Right. You know, this is like. Well, we've talked about this before. This notion that using machinery to build furniture doesn't really take any skill. Oh, no. It's just nonsense, right? right? There's all the, – the, to master a machine, you have to have as much skill as it takes to master a hand tool. Yeah. 
You know, there's yeah. just as much subtlety and nuance in using it as there is in a, in a hand tool. Absolutely. In fact, I was sort of thinking about the the primary difference between hand work and, and machine work. Basically, with hand tool work, and it sounds obvious, is you're holding the the workpiece in place and you're bringing you're moving a tool across it. So all the technique is in using the tool. For machine work, the machine is standing still, and except for a planer your task is to move the workpiece across the machine. And mm -hmm. that takes as much technique and finesse and knowledge of what's going on and how the job is getting done as it does to move a hand plane across a workpiece. Yeah. So Yeah, I've also seen yeah. recently, you know, people on the internet saying that machines are used to pr produce furniture. You know, it, it, it's a production thing, no matter right. what. And hand tools are used to craft furniture. And this distinction, which, again, in the, in, the, in the hands of the right person, a machine is just as much of a creative crafting tool as anything else you could pick up. Like Michael Fortune in a bandsaw? Yeah. Are you kidding me? There's, that's not production work that he does. It's amazing uh, creative uh, process. Yeah, Sam Maloof on a bandsaw. Sam Maloof on a bandsaw. It's, yeah, all these, they're just tools. And yeah. in the right hands, they become... Uh, something more than a tool. They become a creative, you know, implement. Yeah. Or I don't know what the term to call it, but... Yeah, it was just going through... Get off my soapbox, right? Like the <laughs> early... I mean, early James Crown. So we're talking like 70s, you know, um, before terms like hybrid came up and all that. Yeah. And Cranoff was saying, it's like, yeah, you can do everything with a hand tool, but, you know, by the time I get to the place where the hand tools really matter... And I'm out of energy and I'm tired and I'm working with work pieces that are compromised by doing all this work with hand tools where, you know, machine milling can just sort of knock it out. He, he makes a really good point that it, it's counterproductive, Yeah, you know, if, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I don't know. And, and I, I, I don't want to be too didactic because I understand for a lot of people it is about getting in the shop and making shavings. But yeah. for me, because I like making furniture, I'm a furniture maker. Um, where, you know, craftsmanship is paramount. The design of what I'm making is paramount. That's where all my energies go. So I'm just going to get there to that finish point as efficiently as I can. And that means I want the precise results that I'm after with no compromise whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then to get to that <clears throat> result as quickly as possible, you know, pick the right tool for the job. Yeah, I yeah. mean, for me, machines get me to the hand tools faster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, the 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 power the machine I love to use the most is the band. So even, you know, for cutting cur, I just like using that tool. I don't know why. It's just a thing. But uh, you know, table saws, planers and joiners, they're not that pleasant to use. And so once you get finished with all the the rough work, it's great to just break out the hand tools and be you know, do the finessing. For that, me. But I mean one of the things but one of the things I would say is that a joiner in a bandsaw and a table, those can all be used in a sense artistically. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, and it, but and not they're not just brute tools. Art are yeah, art mechanized art in in and just it's just the same thing over and over again. <laughs> there's there's a craft to using that tool. Well, there's, dialing yeah. in joinery, an to it, you know, yeah. on a table saw, cutting miters on a table saw, you know, all that stuff, even getting good rips and cross cuts. Yeah, and the yeah. other irony to say that, oh, machines are about production work, it's like maybe 100 years ago, but if you go into a shop that's doing production work, there aren't joiners and planers and table saws. There's like massive CNC yeah. machines where you put yeah. cheap goods in one end and right. you're popping out furniture out the other end. I mean, that's there's a little bit of irony in that. So. Mm -hmm. Wow, that, uh, I really, know that really went <clears throat> off the rails. Like exit seventy two. Or <laughs> yes, I know. But anytime, <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh... I, yeah, but I, I just, I've been getting. It gets my dander up when I see people dismissing power tools and machinery. It's yeah. because it's just ridiculous. Anyways, let's go on. What's your favorite tool? <laughs> What's your favorite technique? <laughs> I think I have a favorite tool now. <laughs> um, my all-time favorite technique um, is something I had documented a few years ago when I when I made a, a trestle table. But uh, I, for the lower stretcher of the table, I had it was a fairly long workpiece, and I had three tenons um, 
going through the base on either side. And um, I didn't, I, I had a tenon jig at home. I used to use a tenon jig to cut tenons and I didn't want to, you know, cut it that way. So I devised a, a method to cut them on the bands, uh, on the bandsaw. So basically I cut the shoulders on my table saw, the top and bottom and, you know, all around. And then I went to the bandsaw and, and um, cut the cheeks and then trimmed the tenon to width. Since that time, though, I, I had gone on a photo shoot with uh, working with Tim Coleman, and he has a he has a way more accurate method where he uses test blocks to set up all the cuts. So he mills some extra material, you know, the same width as the the real stock, and uh, he dials in all the machine cuts so that in the end, basically, you get the machine set up using the test the test pieces, and then you run all the all the the, the tenant stock you need and then go to the bandsaw and do the same kind of thing with a test piece and then just make all the cuts. And, um, I used it on the base that I, that I made recently. I just didn't photograph it or document it, but it's a really cool method. Um, I like it <laughs> a lot <laughs> and it just, for me, it just simplifies the whole thing. And, and I've basically put my, um, tenoning jig on the shelf and it's sat oh, cool. in a box for the last three years, I think. So, um, it's a really cool method and, and I, we'll have, I'll have Ben post, uh, the link to Tim's article to kind of give you the idea of what, um, what I do. I don't do it exactly the same way he does, but, uh, in principle, it's kind of the same. So you same using uh, spacers to cut the two walls? Instead of flipping the stock, uh, I can't remember. I think the spacer thing sounds familiar. Okay, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Cool, but a long time ago, like a year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have time for one more question, Ben? Sure. Hey, it's just. So Internet space. Space. It's okay to say no. It's unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one comes from Mike. And Mike says, I have a portable table saw on a stand. I want to use a miter sled on the saw, but there isn't enough table between the blade and the edge to balance the sled on. I'm in the process of building an infeed table, but is this the best option? Ideally, not spending another 2000 on a table saw would be nice. Mm. Hmm. Well, I mean... I would say either make a really small sled yeah. so it's not going to tilt off. And I, you know, I'm guessing you can probably cut cross cut stock eight or 10 inches and under on a small sled that maybe not be to be. And the other option is to make a really deep sled so that you can pull it back enough to get some wider stock in there, but still have enough of the sled on the outfeed side intact to maybe yeah. where it balances out. Yeah. Well, my the third solution would be to make. <clears throat> the normal sled, but mm -hmm. put really long runners on it so that it, I imagine because these are T slots probably. So you can make really long runners and then if, however they lock in for, to the T slot, maybe they're T shaped or they have little washers on the bottom, Yeah. but the runners would be all the way through the table. So you could pull that sled back and it would still, it wouldn't tip up. Huh. Yeah, that's cool. I, I have a, a contractor saw, and I, had, I have a similar problem. I don't have a whole lot of room in front of the blade, but I made. Um, I have a very small cross cut sled, and I love it. But I don't pull it all the way back. A lot of the, the cross cuts I make, you know, I can start the the saw with the blade already in the sled. There's enough room oh, to, yeah. to do that. So that's what I do. I think the, his problem with the is the miter cuts that he wants to make because that doesn't give you a whole lot of clearance in the sled. I think, you know, if you're trying to, you know, if I'm thinking of Craig oh, Thibodeau's miter sled. miter sled, you know, it oh, doesn't like give you a, like a little pointy. Triangle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It doesn't oh, yeah. give you a whole lot of room on the sled. Oh, yeah. And I, and I was thinking, uh, so, so instead of having the point go towards the blade, have the point go away from the, that's blade, a good idea. Turn it around and since flip it over, mirror it. Huh. That's, that's cool. Yeah, that, that's a pretty good idea. So you and then you you have it, so you have yeah. Do it that way. Yeah, I mean the other option is to just use your your miter gauge for miters. You know, kind of get a good miter gauge and or make yourself yeah. like a long single runner sled sort of a thing, which yeah. I think we've done articles on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, he does have a Bosch, and it does have T slots. <clears throat> so that yeah. So work. one thing you want to use a, a runner. Of whatever size, whatever you end up, use a runner that is in some way locks into the T slot. Do that. But yeah. I would think this miter thing, if you're talking about the kind that has like meets at a point, just right. flip that over. 
so that the point is facing you. Yeah. And then you can get it, you know? I don't know why that wouldn't work. I don't know either. Yeah. Yeah, you just make a shorter back fence, you know, so you can get the stock to clear on that. Well, except that if it's when it's facing this, facing the blade, it cuts 45 degrees. And if you mirror it, it's going to cut negative 45 degrees. Wrong. I'm really hungry. Hey, it's sunny outside. <laughs> hey, it's snowing. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. That's a good thing. That's. A, I think that means it's time to go. Um, <clears throat> are we done? Buy new tea. Right. I think we're done. And that's it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Please spread the word about Shop Talk Live to your gardening friends and neighbors. Shop Talk Live <laughs> is dependent on your questions, so make sure to send them into Shop Talk at Taunton.com. You can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes. And while you're there, please give us the five-star rating. And don't forget to leave your comments. Someday we'll read more. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. Finally, you can keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook. And look for all of us on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening and have fun in the shop. Oh, and also, um, I did listen to the Home Building Podcast. And we are better than them. <laughs> so, <laughs> we said that to see if any of them actually listen to our entire podcast or not. You guys did a podcast without me? We did. It was yeah. Ben, and Ben was a jerk. So if you're listening and you don't like Ben, maybe I agree with that.